you. Hi, everybody. Thanks very much for coming today. My name is Susanna Bloom. I'm a senior fellow and deputy director of the defense program here at CNAS. Uh, and we are gathered here today to talk about how the Army is going to fight in the future. Uh, and we're very lucky to be joined by uh, Ryan McCarthy, the 33rd Undersecretary of the Army, and Lieutenant General Eric Wesley, the Deputy Commander of Army's Future Command. Thank you so much uh, for being here with me today. Thank you. Uh, I am going to start off this conversation. We're going to do a little, you know, moderated question and answer here, and we'll save the last 15, 20 minutes or so for audience Q&A, so everybody is going to get a chance. Uh, and I want to start, as I usually do in these, these little fireside chats, by talking a little bit about the strategy. So... Uh, the NDS, as we are all very well aware right now, had a renewed focus on strategic competition with China and Russia. And I wonder if you could talk to us a little bit about what does that mean for the Army? Well, first, Susanna, thanks for having us. It's good to get back at CNES. Uh, I, I, when we walked in, we saw the fire was actually, I thought it was a Davos, so uh, but, uh, <laughs> my, my attempt at that. But uh, great opportunity for us to talk about a lot of the, the changes that we are making in the Army to transform the Army to the Army we need by 2028. Uh, you mentioned the National Defense Strategy that we published back in January 2018. Uh, Secretary Mattis really saw the, the need to uh, rebalance the department towards great power competition, which is the central challenge associated with the, really the four planks of the national security, uh, the, na the national defense strategy, uh, nuclear posture, near peer competition, irregular warfare, and partnership capacity. And within the, uh, those four planks, if you will, uh, some choices had to be made in order to maintain the technological margin we've enjoyed, in particular, technological margin that we've enjoyed for so long uh, in, in the force of, of overmatch against near peer competition. So, uh, you know, really when uh, the team was really fielded and, uh, and the work that's been done over the last 20 months or so uh, was some choices we had to make to organize and train and equip the, uh, the force differently and really to look at how we needed to change our operating model. So in the, the fiscal years 18 and 19, we made some initial choices uh, to align our funding against our modernization strategy. But in fiscal 20, we'll see some substantial moves that will be made by the Department of the Army to finance this ambition in the future. Uh, from a readiness standpoint, it is our number one priority. When you're 60% of combatant commanders' requirements worldwide, you got to fill and you have to have a ready force. Uh, so we are still maintaining a, a, a over half our brigades at the highest state of readiness of uh, 22 CTC rotations a year, increased home station training, uh, you know, flight hours as well as t uh, track miles. So uh, our foot is on the gas and we're going to keep it that way till at least fiscal 22 where we get north of two thirds of the force at the highest level of readiness. Uh, some of the biggest moves that we're making uh, in order to uh, uh, make this make this shift towards near peer uh, great power competition uh, is in the way we're modernizing the force that uh, some of the things we need to look at is our operating model <clears throat> Air land battle to multi-domain operations. How we how we how we organize against modernization. We created a four-star command in the form of Army Futures Command, putting the requirements leadership at the table and driving the investments. General Mike Murray, who's the commander, uh, is the chief investment officer for the Army. He has to really look at what are the types of investments we need to make to drive these capabilities. And he's partnered very nicely with Dr. Bruce Jetty, um, and how we finance our six priorities, long-range precision fires, next-generation combat vehicle, future vertical lift, network, integrated air missile defense, and soldier lethality. In 18 and 19, we moved billions of dollars in s and in particular to go after 31 signature systems. But in fiscal year 20, through the 24 program, we're going to have to really open up the pipes and be able to finance this ambition, bringing in LREP tranches of capability and ultimately procuring and fielding full unit to, uh, to the force. That'll require billions of dollars. So the choices that we had to make were very difficult of divesting of legacy and pruning every requirement that we have in our budget to ultimately find uh, north of $30 billion in savings across this 20 to 24 program. And with that, you see about $8 billion of it or so are, are uh, um, cost avoidance. So we've increased our buying power by flattening that cost in the out years. But uh, around $22 billion of just pure cuts and terminations of programs. 
and realigning those dollars against the, the, the six priorities, Army priorities. So moving a lot of money, laser focus, uh, a lot of money against modernization, laser focus against, uh, against readiness. But in particular, why, why the Army's had challenges in the past bringing new weapon systems into the force is because the operating model and the threat why are you bringing this weapon system into the force? So you have to clearly understand the threats we'll face, how we will uh, execute against those threats, and then ultimately, what are the technological capabilities to give you that margin in a fight? Uh, so why multi-domain operations is so important to us, bringing that operating model against the threat, and then the technological capabilities together, and it really is the formula for us to change the force. Great. I do want to circle back to some of those resource issues that you raised, but first I want to turn to General Wesley uh, and ask you to unpack this concept, multi-domain operations. What is it? Yeah, you know, I heard you speaking earlier, Susan. I know that there's some questions on, on multi-domain operations as well. There should be. You know, if you look back, uh, the first thing to note is the purpose of a concept. We call it our operating concept, operating model, as the undersecretary mentioned. You know, it's, it's not just a narrative that we package around the things we want. It serves as a lens or an azimuth that the Army focuses on to, to get to the future. And the, the one time we did this well was with the Air land battle model. A good concept you can't execute when you publish it. It's, it's infeasible. A good concept, and it may seem counterintuitive, but a good concept cannot be achieved because it's your end state. It's your azimuth that you want to shoot for, and it drives you to change um, the Army in this case. So I think a good place to start would be what problem are you trying to solve to better understand what the model does? You know, What problem is, are we trying to solve? You have to ask yourself what change uh, in the last 10 or 20 years, and, and, and several things changed. Number one, you've got this, this increasing revanchist Russia. Um, secondly, you've had unprecedented economic expansion in China, and they've got their own goals and objectives on the horizon. And the third thing is that they watched us in 1991, and they watched us in 2003. And here's what our peers have concluded about combat in the future, and that is that they want no part of close combat with the United States, her partners, and her allies. So if that's true, what do you invest in? What do you invest in if you're a peer? Well, you, you invest in a thing called what we call multiple layers of standoff. They want to keep us at bay, and interestingly, uh, it was serendipitous that we would have withdrawn from the continent and withdrawn from the peninsula, making exacerbating that problem. Um, I oftentimes give the example, you know, we talk a lot about in the United States about uh, the degree to which the Russians were involved in our elections in 2016. That's the first layer of the standoff that our peers invest in in order to fracture cohesion amongst the alliances or amongst nations, not just the United States, Brexit, Catalonia, etc. As you get closer in um, on, the, on the given continent, you're going to run into this problem that we, the area access uh, to area denial. That's that A2AD thing we talk about. They want to install a process or a system of long-range precision fires and long-range air defense. So having withdrawn from the continent the peninsula and their investment into that second layer of standoff makes it very difficult for us to get back into theater. Um, the other thing that they've invested in is they, they've expanded the competition space. And that is, it merely means they are, they are achieving their operational and strategic objectives left of conflict. What's the net effect? That means that we as a nation have found that our deterrent effect has been to a degree inoculated. So how do you solve the multiple layers of standoff, and how do you solve the fact that they are achieving their objectives and are exploiting comp the competition space? Well, the National Defense Strategy tells us how to do this on, on, in broadly, and one of the things that we talk about is they want us to get into the competition space. The NDS tells us to get into the competition space. The other thing is it acknowledges that we are challenged in all domains, and this is where the, uh, the name multi-domain operations come from. We as a, as a nation are used to dominating all domains over the last 30 years. It's not even a question to us. If we have to deploy to a given theater, we know that we own the air. We know that we own the sea lanes. We know we own the electromagnetic, spe electromagnetic spectrum. And we don't worry about those things. And that is something that we have become. Our, our muscle memory and to some degree, you know, our expectations have been softened to a degree. That won't be true in the future. So the solution, a couple things. 
Um, the, the, the name multi-domain operations finds itself um, to some degree has got its DNA in airland battle. So we had airland battle and the integration of air and land, but we found is the domains have expanded. So multi-domain battle was the original document and we now call it multi-domain operations. Why do we change it from battle to operations? Because we have to get into the competition space, which I'll talk about more in a minute. So the idea of understanding that we do not dominate all domains means the way you beat it, if you're being challenged, is you have to optimize all of those domains in the competition, in a decisive space within competition, so that the total is greater than the sum of the parts. That's something that we can do very well. Let me give you the, uh, I'll give you a five part problem that we're solving with this and then I'll hit it back to you so you can get into specific questions. If standoff is your problem, there's a five part means to get back into the space. First, expand the competition space. You have to have a stance. If you imagine Evander Holyfield, he's got reach on you, man. And so if you want to beat Evander Holyfield, you got to get a good stance. That's the competition space. We got to get in that space and the United States doesn't do that well. Second, you have to penetrate. If he's got reach on you, you have to get in. So it's no surprise that we would invest in long-range precision fires, as an example. You have to penetrate. And then third, you have to disintegrate their systems so that you can enable the fourth, which is exploitation for the purpose of your objectives. And then you return to competition. So I'll wrap it up and say this. this if we, if, if you, somebody asks you, what's the problem the United States Army is trying to solve? It's multiple layers of standoff. What's the solution? We're going to compete. We're going to get into the competition space and aggressively compete with them. I can give you details on that. Then penetrate, disintegrate the systems, exploit, return to competition. Mm -hmm. So I think I would really like to dig a little bit deeper on this question of expanding the competitive space or, or moving into a, a space that we haven't been, we, the United States, had not been competing in as effectively. Can you elaborate on what you mean there and yeah. maybe give us a couple examples? So this is going to, I think this is going to uh, engender debate. We need to have this discussion because it goes back to our culture to a degree. Um, if you go back to our, the DNA of our roots, we don't see ourselves, Americans, as war fighting people. In fact, we see um, warfare as an anomaly. And, and when that anom anomaly presents itself, we reconcile it, and then we presume we go right back to peacetime. It's a digital view in our cultural DNA. The reason I bring that up is our peers don't see it that way. They see a continuum of constant competition. Um, that's problematic for us because we as a nation find it unattractive to a degree if we, particularly uniform personnel, are too actively engaged when there's no, when there's no war. Um, if you go to the USER commander, General Cavoli, um, relative to his counterpart on the other side, he doesn't have the authorities and capacity to compete in peacetime like uh, like his counterpart does. So there's three things that we're saying that we have to improve as an army and as a nation. The first is we have to counter unconventional warfare and information warfare um, on a daily basis. Those are That space that the Russians in particular, to some degree the Chinese, have exploited greatly to their benefit. You wonder why Crimea was annexed without them firing a shot. Because they were able to get into that space with UW and IW, and, and we find ourselves at a loss for how to counter it on a daily basis. The second is we have to conduct intelligence preparation of the battlefield very aggressively in ways that we haven't been doing the last 30 years. In the 1980s, it was easy to see where the Soviet Union was, was aligned because you took a satellite photo, you could see where tanks and, and artillery was, and you could pick, figure out their, the, the geographic laydown could show you their order of battle. Now. You have to stimulate that space, whether it be identifying where radars are, for example, all of which are turned off right now. How do you stimulate those radar to turn them on? Um, that is something that can, be hap that can be achieved across the domains, and it has to happen every single day actively to enable targeting. If you do those two things, now you're starting to show a deterrent effect. That, that's an army that's prepared to rapidly transition a conflict if necessary. Unfortunately, right now, we give our senior leaders frankly two options. One, do nothing, which is always an option, or protracted conflict. What multi-domain operations does is it fills in those two extremes with two other options. By aggressively uh, competing in that space, you force your peers to recalculate what, what might have been their, their objectives. 
Um, secondly, it allows you to win in a short conflict, which again forces your peers to recalculate what might have been their 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 objectives. Mm -hmm. But right now, we don't have those two middle yeah. options. So if I can dig a little bit deeper, yeah. even on that, yeah. um, and and I'll reframe a little bit, and you can tell me if you agree or disagree. Um, you know, our, one argument you could make is that conventional deterrence against China and Russia is highly successful, right? And you mentioned that a little bit at the top of, of your remarks, right? They're not going to uh, come at us in a way we want them to or expect them right. to necessarily, right? They've learned their lesson. They've gone to school in the way that we fight wars. And as a result, they are engaged in behavior that is calculated to come in below our red lines right. for large-scale conventional conflict. So if they've designed those behaviors for example, annexation of Crimea, which is a, you know one of the more bold examples, uh, to come in below our threshold. How do you deter activity that is calculated to do that? Are, are you suggesting that we, in fact, lower our thresholds? You no, know, I'm suggesting that if we get into that same space, not necessarily rising to a level of conflict, they will, see, they will determine two things. One, that we are serious and that we will engage them. And two, we have the capacity to stop it if we chose. So in the case of um, what happened in Crimea, eastern Ukraine, even if we wanted to do something, we would be limited in our capacity to do so without some massive buildup. Um, if you ask yourself, let's take it this direction, Suzanne. If, if, if you're good with the annexation of Crimea or the incursion in the eastern Ukraine, um, the annexation of the Sea of Azov is what NPR said after the conflict at the Kerch Strait um, two months ago. If you're okay with that, then and, and you would never see a scenario where you would want to counter it or demonstrate the capacity to, to, to counter it, um, then you wouldn't have to worry about what we're talking about. Mm -hmm. But if you're concerned that those behaviors could find themselves presenting a threat in the Balkan, Baltics, excuse me, you have to ask yourself, would you have the capacity to challenge that? And under the current framework, you may not. Mm -hmm. And so how does that concept relate to this idea of having multiple layers of standoff? What does that mean in a practical sense? Can you walk us through an example there? So that, that is the first layer in many ways. And, they, and they've, they've pushed that layer out so far that they can achieve these objectives without us having the ability to do anything about it. Um, so I guess the point would be, what's the alternative? The alternative is if you're present, if you have some combination of force posture and you aggressively competed and you demonstrated the ability to rapidly deploy and rapidly transition a conflict, mm -hmm. those decisions that they've baked that you described, they may think twice about, likely would think twice about. Okay. Um, I... I, you mentioned that um, multi-domain operations is kind of a natural evolution from airland battle, but there was another joint operational concept that actually came in between those two temporally, and that was air-sea battle, where if we take the name on its face, the army was a little bit cut out of the pattern. And so I wonder um, how we, you know, definitionally, when you describe operations in multi-domains, that's a joint concept, right? Mm -hmm. So, you know, where's, where's the Navy thinking about this? What's the Air Force think about this? Is this something that the Army is offering yeah. to the joint force, or is it an Army concept that the other services will have to figure out how to plug into? Right. So I want to go back first, and then I'll sure. come to that. First yeah. is, I think that um, it's, it finds its DNA in airland battle because we've significantly added to the domains, but the way we're going to fight is, is fundamentally different in the way I described. Back then, it was you know, defeat the second echelon. It was a much more symmetric in the way that Soviets fought at the time. This is a um, much different formation that we're facing. But to your, to your point, I think this is absolutely fundamental. It, it's not just an army concept. It's not just a joint concept. It's not even just a whole of government concept. It requires whole of nation in many ways. But it starts at the joint force. And, and here's what I would tell you is, as with all um, joint issues, it, it takes some work to bring everybody together because each service obviously has its own interests. Here's what we do know. All the services are coming together in terms of their agreement that, the, that mastering the domains in the way the joint force must will be fundamental to win in the next fight. All the services agree that multi-domain C2 is our biggest challenge. And then third, all the services uh, see this as an offensive effort, and all of the services 
see China and Russia as the two peers that we have to align it against. The Army is most aligned with the Air Force right now in terms of time horizon, the ideas, and the, and the naming conventions that we're using. Uh, to a lesser degree, the Marine Corps and, and the Navy, but we are actively collaborating with them. And I think what you're seeing is these things come closer together. Let me give you a, just a historic um, note, though, just for, for encouragement sake, is um, in the early 1980s, you probably heard of the 31 initiatives, right? And the 31 initiatives was um, 31 problems that the Air Force and the Army wanted to solve. And what forced them to do it was the fact that the Soviets presented a problem. What we see is when our peers present problems is it sort of forces the joint force together. And we're already seeing that alignment in an increasing ways. Mm -hmm. When did you start working on multi-domain operations? When was it born? My memory indicates prior to the NDS. That's correct. Yeah. Yeah, it was after uh, the Army operating concept in 2014. Originally, it was an idea identified as multi-domain battle. And uh, we published 1.0 about a year and a half ago in multi-domain battle about a year and a half ago. Uh, and in the course of the last 18 months or so is when we've really put rigor to it. And let me say that, you know, there's a, there is a lot of rigor that's gone into this work. It's not just a hypothesis. In fact, the hypothesis has been, has been demonstrated as valid. We've done a n- number of war games in the last 18 months where it achieves what we assert that it will achieve. That means we're achieving operational strategic objectives by em- employing this manner in the way we fight. Mm-hmm differently than the prior two years. Mm -hmm. Great. Um, Secretary McCarthy, I want to come back to you. You mentioned the six modernization priorities in your remarks at the top, and I wonder if you could tell me how those relate to multi-domain operations or the operational concept. So, you know, which came first? Is there an iterative process there? You know, can you tell us a little bit about how those evolved? Yeah, the, um, I think General Wesley can help fill in the gaps that I may not miss. The, uh, initially, through multi-domain battle, they had a chart where they looked at all the different capabilities that you needed and it looked like the state of Oklahoma. And we called it the Oklahoma chart. Remember this? And uh, how sophisticated we were, right? And, and so anyways, when we looked at how all those capabilities laid in uh, to enable from a, the, the, from the weapon system standpoint, that we started pulling them out and we knew we had to put in a firm prioritization because you know, whatever choices we made, we had to find a way to finance it. Uh, and what has been you know, an up and down fiscal environment since the beginning of the Budget Control Act. Uh, so uh, a lot of those uh, s- systems were, uh, capabilities were identified when the multi-domain battle work started. Uh, and then in the fall of 2017, uh, we convened uh, all the senior leaders in the Army and uh, put down the, the six uh, priorities with the two complementary efforts, position navigation, timing, and synthetic training environment, uh, and then started look, racking and stacking what were those weapon systems that you really needed. Uh, we wanted to put a firm prioritization against it because we wanted to. You know, we had to find a way to finance it. Mm-hmm. Uh, so uh, the work really did start when the multi-domain battle, but uh, to, to General Wesley's point, the rigor really began in the fall of 17. Okay. And so is it the operational concept that's driving the modernization priorities or the modern Organization priorities that are driving the operational concept. Right. So, a, Which uh, I, uh, or so I think it, it, they, 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 if you if we do it right, they will force each other, mm-hmm. and you will learn. You'll bring the technical capability together with the operating concept, and that's where the push and pull will be, where you'll make trade offs with requirements, and ultimately that's that's where the magic will happen. That's where I think where the army has failed for several decades is because what was that operating. Uh, that what was the threat and what was the operating concept and ultimately what were the systems that you needed? Because if you can get these first two right, you can work through the technological maturity challenges and ultimately make the trade-offs and then pull it through the knot hole and, and get it in the force. But if you can't get the first two right, you'll never get there in the back end. Mm-hmm. I'm sorry. I didn't mean to touch no, sure. That's exactly right. And so the theoretical construct is concepts always drive the modernization of your army across the enterprise doctrine, organization, training, material development. All of that should be driven by the theoretical theoretical construct of your of your concept. The truth is, it's a little bit of both. Why? because you're learning. So if you go back to Airland Battle, that was published as a concept in 1981. Well, the work on the Abrams tank began well before that. So these things happen in iteration.
limitations. But you want to have a, a concept driving your modernization across the enterprise, and that's what we have right now. To the Undersecretary's point, um, these things don't happen in a vacuum. So although we identified the, the six modernization priorities before we had a published concept, the same organization that was developing the requirements that became the six modernization priorities were also working hard to understand the operational environment and develop an MDO. Mm -hmm. And should we expect to see any changes in the way that the Army is organized to support these new concepts? I'm thinking, you know, new or different force structure or you know, designed to support different missions. We, air we air think defense there, comes to there, mind. There's going to be a fundamental change in the organizational structure to fight the way we're describing. And again, you have to go back. You know, we went to modularity and we were fighting counterinsurgency fights. The BCT was the coin of the realm, the brigade combat team. In, the, in large scale ground combat operations, and particularly one in the future operating environment, is going to require echelons above brigade, all of which will solve unique and distinct problems that a given BCT can't solve by itself. So you'll see us uh, seek to build out echelons above brigade, the division, the corps, even potentially a field army in a given theater that can manage these theater problems that otherwise wouldn't be achieved. I would argue that the organizational realignment uh, will probably be even a bigger problem than the material requirements. Mm -hmm. We'll find that some of the, the Compo 2 and 3 alignment, we'll have to make some trades across Compo 1 to Compo 2 and 3 and vice versa, just so that we have the ability to be have a force posture that can rapidly transition if necessary, which then presents the deterrent. Yeah, so that's my next question is, uh, you know, as you're looking at changing the organizational structure of the Army, are you thinking about you know, what remains in the United States versus what is overseas. You talked a little bit about the stance or the posture. You yeah, so that at all. That's right. So the NDS talks about the contact and blunt forces. Contact are those that are in theater all the time in either rotational or permanent. And then the blunt are those that you can rapidly move into theater as necessary. It's getting that rheostat right and getting the right mix between contact and blunt forces that the NDS refers to that will be the work of the next few years years as we war game this thing continually. Regardless, I think you're going to find that there at some point will have to be a debate on the degree to which we have forward presence uh, may potentially increased in the future. Mm -hmm. And, and where do you and, and the multi-domain operations concept come down on that question? We, where we come down is you have to have contact forces. Right. Um, what we're working on is how to optimize what that balance is. Mm -hmm. you, you have to have headquarters and fires commands that can be a deterrent effect immediately. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, you, you run into finding fait accompli outcomes that our peers will achieve. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, I, turning back to the question of resources, right? So the program, you know, when everything is done correctly, uh, it should come out in a way that it's very clear how it has changed in order to support the NDS, in order to support multi-domain operations concept and the six modernization priorities, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and Secretary McCarthy, I wonder if you can tell us a little bit about the process that the Army leadership has gone through and mm -hmm. looking at how to change the program and, and shift away perhaps from some of those you know legacy big ticket items into uh, new procurement or different procurement in support of these concepts so you all probably heard of the affectionate term night court that the army staff gave our process last spring and summer the army staff has a sense of humor uh, we um, met as a senior leadership team for about 70 hours or so uh, from the spring into the summer and reviewed every program, did a zero-based budget approach. Uh, Secretary, Chief, myself, General McConville, all the major Army commands, Chief Staff, Secretary, Principals only. We all did our own homework. Um, and we reviewed every program. And, uh, with I just want to pause there and note yeah. that that's, that's actually pretty remarkable to take a zero-based approach to building a program. It's not a normal. Uh, it was, yes, it was, uh, it was far more aggressive and even uh, at least the, the level of detail we went through uh, was, it was on par with what I did when I worked for uh, Secretary Gates about 10 years ago. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, it was extremely aggressive and uh, kept us at the Pentagon a lot last spring and summer. And uh, so the two philosophical points that really the Secretary and the Chief wanted to see was divesting of legacy 
and pruning every requirement we could to find every penny we could to finance our ambition. Uh, you know, the, probably half of the those signature systems that we're investing against are new developmental programs, which will, you know, they'll have, you know, always have challenges. So we're trying to ensure that we could finance this ambition. And uh, so uh, a lot of effort, but the, the, the reason why they called it night court is because we literally sat there and we ran them through the process and they had to justify every investment uh, that was brought forward. Uh, this is where uh, the target was what you have probably seen in our modernization strategy we delivered to Congress back in the spring of 18 was uh, north of $20 billion. But really the, the goal is to save every dollar we can. Uh, uh, Dr. Esper and General Milley are pushing hard for reform really to become a behavior in the Army. Uh, so we those the additional funding that we found is to help us finance uh, the OSIT infantry training or extending infantry basic training to 22 weeks. ACFT equipment, a lot of these things so that we can continue to invest in our people and our readiness objectives uh, and to also have just enough trade space, developing the trade space we need uh, in the out years of this budget. The, a lot of the cuts you'll see are in the back end of the budget because uh, that's where we will need the financing the most because that's when these L-RIP tranches are going through the operational test and be, start the fielding uh, to, to units worldwide. Mm -hmm. So you mentioned these figures at the top, but I think they're probably worth repeating in this context. You've freed up about thirty billion in headroom. Uh, north of that, yes. Yeah. And uh, so it's important to emphasize that you know eight billion is cost avoidance, but that's you pay for that. That's where you lose your buying power year over year because it's costs over and above inflation. So we flatten the costs in many of those programs. About twenty-two billion were just pure cuts and terminations mm -hmm. of existing programs. Mm -hmm. And but principal in the out years. So it's 33 uh, spread billion. Spread out across the fit up. Okay. Yes. So 33 billion or 30, did you just say 33 over north five of 30, years? North of 30 billion across five, five years. Five years. Great. Um, and I know you're not able to get into any specifics on, on what. Not for another week. Not for another week. We got to wait till next Monday. But um, any kind of big trends we should be on the lookout for in particular? Um, any new missions that have maybe received renewed attention in this program? We are divesting legacy systems. So I think you'll, you'll probably look there first. Okay. Uh, we uh, so and then, but it, it's it's no problem. Uh, no no uh, issue was too big or too small. We looked at what really were the return on investment of every dollar. If if, if you could continue to look at incremental upgrades that would yield the capability we need to support the operating model we're, we're changing to, uh, then it would survive. But if they were they were weapon systems that were legacy systems that you just can't engineer another ounce out of them. We're making these hard choices to move out. You know, what, one point I'd make too, sir, particularly for industry who would, might be concerned because they see a $30 billion swing and, the, and it might create anxiety as to how, how often is this going to happen. And I, I think what the, um, the senior leadership would say is that this is somewhat of an anomaly based on our desire to focus on the 2028 vision and identification that we have two peer threats that have significantly invested in the things I talked about earlier and an operating concept that is focusing the Army very specifically on the requirements to get there. And we've struggled over the last 30 years or so because, and it probably correctly, we could have been criticized for having a Chinese menu of things that we wanted but couldn't articulate, why do you want those things? Well, now you've got a lot of things coming into alignment. We have a concept, we have a threat, we have the NDS and, and leadership who are willing to make hard cuts to focus the Army on the things that we absolutely must have to achieve that NDS. And so I think you'll see, with, as we publish a modernization strategy, that you're going to see that attenuate over time, and you'll see some consistency that will be significant for the next 10 Coupled years. with the fact that there will be billions of dollars of opportunity across all of these portfolios, so it's not like we're reducing top line or walking away. Mm -hmm. There's immense opportunity uh, in this fit-up. I wonder to what extent this um, substantial realignment is also a function of past failures in Army modernization programs. I think there could be an element to that. You know, there are uh, a lot of the choices are just if you're looking at the bulk of our systems, if you look at the big five, there are 40 over 40 years old. And you can we, you know, I think I believe our acquisition community's done a remarkable job with incremental upgrades over time. 
but there's just so far you can take a 40 year old system. And as we deal in the 21st century, we have to find new capabilities and we're going to fight differently. Mm -hmm. So um, there, there's some hard choices in this budget and there'll be more in the future. What do you think the biggest changes are in the way that the Army is approaching this modern, route of modernization versus kind of the future combat system yeah. moment? I like Eric to comment as well, but uh, the empowerment of the requirements community that, uh, you know, if you really look at the chief, the vice, General Murray, their, their participation and their leadership in this process has really been remarkable. Uh, the, the push for the operating concept. Uh, so those two key factors for, for what I've seen is that it, when they take the ownership and they take the lead, that's really the customer talking about what they want. Mm -hmm. And that clear interpretation between them and the acquisition community, you're going to get a system that will meet your needs. And uh, you can't outsource it. You got to be in there and you got to grind and fight it every day. Uh, and that's really what's happening this time. So from a requirement standpoint, convening all those senior leaders and walk to, walking through the trade-offs on a weapon system from threshold to objective requirements. And really the work, and I'll hand it over to Eric, on multi-domain operations. Refining that operating concept and making that how we go about and do our business is everything. So I, that's why I have such high confidence in this effort because uh, those two key factors. Yeah, the intersectors, right. They're, they're, they're not even, in many ways, not even comparable, and here's why. So in, for about 25 years, we were a capabilities-based army. You know, after the Berlin Wall went down, we went away from a threat-based approach. That's really dangerous because you can have innumerable uh, numbers of uh, capabilities. So it was a capability um, that we were pursuing, and it was a system that we were building. Turn that on its head, what we're doing now is we are threat based and we're and we're designing the concept against how we want to fight and win so it's separate from the capability separate from the system and it's focused on the threat and how we want to fight okay um, since we're talking a little bit about um, the, these changes in the way the Army is approaching modernization. I wonder if you could tell us about Futures Command specifically and what impact that has had, the creation of Futures Command has had on the way the Army buys things, yeah. develops and buys things. Two big points I would make is, one is, if you look back to 1965, uh, the government outspent industry, depending on how you measure, two to three to one. Um, nowadays, it's inverted. Industry and private sector is outspending government in R&D, two to three to one. If that's true, uh, we want to be in that space because for years, our old industrial model, we were able to have our own labs and our own systems because we were two-thirds of, of the investments. But if two-thirds of the investments are in the private sector, we need to get in the private sector because we're missing ideas. Why would, we, why would we isolate ourselves from these great ideas that we're not even seeing on a daily basis? So getting down into Austin, for example, and getting into accelerator um, labs, hubs, incubators, et cetera, et cetera allows us to be exposed to more things. The second big point I would make is that we as an enterprise were modernizing across the scope of our entire enterprise. Requirements were developed in TRADOC. Um, we have, we're doing prototyping in AMC. Uh, the Secretary's office was responsible for acquisition and any number of spaces in between. That means you've got uh, a given requirement being thrown over the transom in various aspects of a very large enterprise. And what, by the leadership of the secretary and the, and the chief and the undersecretary and the vice, is what they've done is they've created an organization that puts all of that under one umbrella. And not only the, the trades and the leadership decisions that allow us to refine and focus our efforts towards those really important things we need to make, but the money flows that way too. Mm -hmm. So we've tightened the shot group on where decisions are being made, and I think it gives us a great opportunity to be decisive on trades and investments. Okay. And so um, I guess I guess I just kind of want to ask you, how's that working out, right? So Army Futures Command is still in its early, relatively early days. Um, and, and what you're describing is uh, sort of, you know, these storied, long-standing institutions like Training and Doctrine Command, like ASALT, yeah. right? How is that all kind of coming together? 
you know, in particular, when you've got the guy at the top who's not in D.C., and, and many of those other right. components are here. So as, if anybody's been involved in an acquisition or a merger, you know it's, it's, it's hard work, hard government work in this case. Um, and so, yeah, there's, there's challenges when you stand up a new four-star command. But if you go back in time, we stood up TRADOC in the 1970s, too, and, and it re resulted in the Army we know and love today. You got it. If you don't change, you, you, you know, you'll never get there. And so, so we're changing. But we're already seeing the results of the change. You know, we've turned, for example, Futures and Concepts Center, which formerly was Arctic, on its head. We used to be a bottom-up process. We're now top-down, bottom-up, refined, because we know the organization and the Army we want to build. And so we're able to drive behavior and prioritize resources in a much more effective manner. So, yes, there's challenges, but there's opportunities that I haven't seen in probably 10 years. Okay. Anything else you want to tell us about the command? How's it going? Well, we just, I just came from Austin, in fact, and in fact, you ought to visit it. It's got, it's part of, there's three parts of the footprint. There's a headquarters, there's headquarters things. It's in a high rise. It's unlike any four star you've ever been to. Um, went, spent some time in a place called Capital Factory, which is a tech incubator. We've got a whole floor that uh, we've got there built out with DIUX and other uh, military industry modernization efforts where Army Futures come and we'll have a lab there to interface with all a number of tech startups to develop ideas. And we held the conference in the makerspace within University of Texas Systems, which is a place where we'll be able to prototype. So you see change happening very quickly, and you see those decisions coming together. I encourage you all to go visit uh, University of Texas Systems or Capital Factory in Austin if you're there. Okay. And Secretary McCarthy, I'll just give you the last word on this topic. Um, how has the creation of Futures Command changed the way that you interact with these functions within the Army, you and, and Secretary Esper? Well, we uh, the thing we're most excited about is it's fusing together requirements and acquisition. Mm -hmm. That uh, General Mike Murray and Dr. Bruce Jetty, when they come together, shoulder to shoulder in every discussion, and the more you can tightly couple that relationship, the more successful we're going to be and weapons systems development. So it's really the teamwork and the culture. And we're excited about that. The, you know, the good thing, uh, one of the things that, uh, that Eric described was ultimately is we're engaging with parts of commercial industry that we had not really been working with before. It's helping us think differently and it's bringing different players to the fold uh, to help us drive solutions. So uh, culture and behavior, it's not to say that there will not be challenges, but it's this uh, this collaboration is the is the goal, and uh, and that really will be the secret sauce in the end. Good. Uh, well, with that, I'd like to open it up to our audience for questions. Uh, do we have a mic? If you could, when I call on you, if you could just wait for the microphone to come to you right here, first in the orange shirt. Salmon, I think, right? So, <laughs> salmon. <laughs> you, you could even call it pink. I've, I'm secure in my masculinity. Or I think it's salmon. Around. It's making me hungry. <laughs> <laughs> Hi. Uh, Sydney Friedberg, Breaking Defense and apparently unorthodox shortware. Uh, I wanted to... Uh, you know, focus on the thing I've been working on uh, the Army's Atlas program a little bit, which inspired some uh, excited headlines about killer weapon, killer AI, and so forth. You know, one of the, th the threads that's going through all the big six areas is increased use of automation, artificial intelligence, machine learning. Uh, you know, how do you, you know, reassure people that that, you know, won't go into the, you know, the dark future of, you know, skeleton-shaped robots hunting us all down? Uh, but also, you know, talk, you know, why wouldn't you want fully automated weapons? I mean, the, what, what's the reason to keep that human being, you know, in the command position decisively in the loop as opposed to, you know, just creating something you can wind up and go? I want to take that. Um, well, our policy is having a human in the loop because a human understands context. You can... You can generate data very, I mean, they, they can analyze the data within a nanosecond, however fast they do it. But you have to have a human being to understand the context, to put that guidance in there, whether or not you were to take the shot under that scenario. So um, I, at least, I would not foresee that being any different in the near future than what I just said just a second ago here. So um, that's why, um, at least from our standpoint, there would be a human in the loop. Uh, we have an AI task force that is working uh, with um, 
and purely on the concept of just artificial intelligence, how would we, uh, how do we, you know, condition our force so that folks can learn about artificial intelligence, where there could be potentially applications to support us uh, in military operations. So uh, we've we started that I think back in the fall of last year, and uh, so we're working. That is a part of Futures Command, which works for General Murray. Uh, we are working with some companies on concepts of that today. Uh, so uh, we are, you know, really starting to put rigor and focus against that uh, that unique capability. General Wesley, did you? Well, I would just add to the a couple of things. One is there's a lot of prototyping and experimentation that has to be done before we have independent robots. We're looking at um, AI and robotics to extend our capacity, not necessarily to replace. It, it, most people know the story of David and Goliath. You know that, that was probably one of the few times in world history where, when the giant goes down, the war's over. And because you have robots on the battlefield, does not mean there isn't a subsequent engagement. Robots uh, or robotic tanks, whatever the case may be, augment and uh, augment our capacity and extend range. So another reason for the, uh, the, to reinforce what the secretary said: you're always going to have uh, armies that will be engaged in this effort. Just here in the second row. Uh, I'm Harlan Ullman with the Atlantic Council and the Naval War College. Uh, the War College is running a series of uh, experiments looking at alternative strategies. Tom Modley and the Vice Chief of the Navy are responsible for this. And we're looking much more at a strategy of containment because, quite frankly, the NDS says we have to deter and defeat. And we don't quite see how you're going to defeat Russia or China in a war that could be nuclear. So what are your views about how do you beat Russia or China in a war that could be nuclear? We haven't seen anybody talk about that. And as you know, the Commission on the National Defense Strategy had some striking observations. So comments, please. So this is an issue that we're going to have to um, debate over the coming years. So the NDS, as you say, says, d does say deter and defeat. And the first question you have to ask yourself is uh, the degree to which you think we're deterring now. Evaluate that. Uh, I brought up a few points uh, that we just talked about earlier, the degree to which that deterrence is effective or if they've inoculated themselves to a degree. If you want to change that, you bring up a great point. But right now, you got, if you have two options, do nothing, that doesn't end well because in the case of Europe, you probably have a real undermining of, uh, of NATO and if you can't apply Article 5. Secondly, if you, if you do go to a, a conflict, I said it's going to be a protracted one, and protracted ones end bad to your point, uh, when you've got a nation with nuclear weapons. If there's middle space, that is that you can compete, you can more effective, expand the competition space, you more effectively deter. And then when you talk about how do you win a conflict in that, there are scenarios where you can win a short conflict as long as you don't find yourself into the, you know, the, uh, the uh, continent proper of the nation that you're, you're dealing with. There, are, there is neutral ground where conflicts can exist where we've demonstrated in war games where you force an opponent to recalculate their objectives because they don't want to go to an all-out nuclear war. We could, we, could talk, we could pull that thread if you wanted, but um, there are scenarios where you would be in neutral space, and that's where you want to come out on top very quickly. We should share with you our view of a porcupine defense and a mobile maritime strategy. Yes, deal with this, it also brings down on how we compete, because quite frankly, we're not doing well with that Right, which goes to the competition space. I'm not convinced we're competing well, which means we have allowed our deterrent capability to be diluted. Karen uh, Thanks. Yeah, Patrick Tucker with Defense One. Just to, to follow up on that real quick, how does the uh, the modernization priorities and all the new tech and things that you're buying actually help you in that more liminal uh, competition space? Like I understand what long range fires do in terms of a, a specific effect, but in what you're talking about, this more hybrid sort of foggy area of next generation warfare and as of sea stuff, how does all the tech and the modernization priorities help you compete better there? Right. So a couple things. Um, 
multi-domain operations is as much about how you fight as much as it is about bringing weapons to bear. And I think you've acknowledged that. You've acknowledged that long-range precision fires is important when you've got a range problem. We acknowledge that um, air missile defense is critical when you know you're going to be challenged in all domains. You understand why we need the network when we're going to be challenged in all domains. One of the things I mentioned is that if, if you are going to be able to penetrate and disintegrate those systems, it has to be to, to some end. And therefore, you need an ability to exploit, which brings in your need for next generation combat vehicle that has the agility, deployability, capability, um, but also soldier lethality. So all of these things fit in that. Your question has to do with the competition space. What, how does that help? The competition space is largely behavior. Um, behavior before conflict. So the weapon systems that we have prioritized as part of the six modernization priorities wouldn't necessarily enable that because we're talking about authorities, IW, countering IW, UW, um, conducting intelligence preparation of the battlefield to a small degree. The network would help you with that. But most of these things things in the competition space are not kinetic and therefore wouldn't be some of the major weapon systems that we're investing in. It's behavioral. Do you have anything to add? Okay. No. no. Okay. Um, and the very back row there on the edge, I'm sorry, second from the back row on the aisle. Hi, uh, Ben Kessling with the Wall Street Journal. You, uh, General, you spoke about having multiple layers of standoff uh, for, for future conflict. In what ways do other parts of government, you said there's a whole government approach as well. What ways is the Army, DOD, having to interact with state, USAID, Department of the Interior, to build in, to build in the, the hard work of diplomacy? And is there ways in which, in the future, there's a threat that the Army, that the Pentagon will be sort of of out of ahead of its skis, dealing with quasi diplomatic stuff, quasi economic stuff that really needs buy in from other departments, and how are you all building that up? Yeah, I think that's a, a great point because when I talk about expanding the competition space, my sen our sense is that the majority of that work is going to be done by the inter elements of the interagency and specifically, you know, the country teams. The, what we would argue though is the problem right now is we have largely a traditional approach to policy and. and a lot of it ends up within the, the company team and that creating a coherence across the interagency for a theater that's agile and effective that can counter events that are happening today, we probably need to raise the bar on that. And all we're saying is if you don't, if you don't, you're not giving yourself a good stance or a good footprint within the theater to counter quickly as necessary. We, we don't think we're doing it to the degree we need to to be effective in a given theater right now. Who leads that push? Does it need to come from like the White House? Does it need to come from uh, you know an interagency task force? And is there anything on the horizon that's going to make the, everybody connect and talk? To you? Yeah, I don't know that it's the Army's role necessarily to specify who it will be. We're, identi we're, we're identifying as, as something that needs to happen, a problem that needs to be solved. And so whenever, you know, it, when you do uh, modernization, it goes across that very ugly acronym, DOTMLPF. Well, one of the P's is policy. And so we, we submit to um, the Department of Defense our recommendations for how we need to fight in the future. And one of them is to get after this issue of expanding competition space, competing, and that might require certain policy changes for military sales and then in Europe we're doing a lot with training with, with partners and it, it's every time that you get over there it's really remarkable the relationships they have on the ground with the US mission and you know the given country where they're training so uh, it's very encouraging uh, the work that's being done and it's just uh, how much more we can sustain that and how aggressive we can be just right there. Hi, uh, Matt Baynard, Defense Daily. Jumping back to a topic from a couple questions ago, um, you've already mentioned a few times long-range precision fires, and I believe the Army has listed that at the top of the six modernization priorities. So I was wondering, uh, between the Night Court process and the continued refinement of the MDO concept, uh, below long-range precision fires, how have those other priorities ranked out, or is it that as number one and the other five on an equal plane. I know Night Court was intended to fully fund all those 
efforts, but just has that kind of ranking um, sorted itself out? They're in order. One, two, three, four, five, six. Uh, but uh, we found a way to finance those 31 across this fit-up. Now, um, Congress has a vote, obviously, and will dispose accordingly. Uh, but we, you know, we are, we, if you kind of stack, we, we've gone through the painful process of one day in. And we're, we're ensuring that we're, we're trying to send the message to everyone, this is what we need in order. And it's something that historically we, we don't, you can't spread the peanut butter too thin. You got to make choices. And we've done that. So uh, in a week, we'll be able to talk about it in detail. Other questions? Sure. Just here in the front row. So uh, it, uh, Brian McCullough, I work for Lockheed Martin. Um, along the lines of talking about top lines and about cuts, and then there's word that the budget's going to come out with a large OCO chunk, so actually the base budget at a lower number. So um, any sense that that's going to jeopardize any of the modernization? Or if not, then what, what, does, what would that uh, potentially put into jeopardy in, in general terms? Thank you. I'd be speculating. I don't know. I didn't know the, the final. I know they're working away on that, so I'm really not going to comment about that right now. Okay. Sorry. Okay. Just here in the aisle, second row. Hi, Ashley Roki with Janes. Um, as you're looking at the six modernization priorities and you're talking about you know, some of these programs of the past, the legacy, it's been 40 years. Are you looking at a different life cycle for these new programs that are coming up where it might only be 10 years? Mm -hmm. And then you're gonna have to look at something new and start investing you know, within five years to have something else. How are you approaching that as you move forward? So with all of the, when we laid in the, these RFPs, uh, the sector and the chief actually led every one of these kind of requirements, KPP exercises for hours on the, these signature systems. And every one of them was a growth margin. So we built in, you know, 40, 50% growth margin on all these weapon systems. So whatever came out the door, we wanted something that we could spiral new capabilities in going forward. We were very fortunate. You know, if you look at the Abrams or you look at the Bradley, I mean, the, the, the growth margin achieved on those weapon systems were exponentially higher than was initially in those initial RFPs back in the 70s and 80s. So um, that's the key is growth. And, we'll, and that, that's the only way we can try to have uh, to, to stack really the life cycle of that weapon system so you can enjoy it for 20, 30 years like we have with these others. That was the intent, yes. Just because if you think of how long it takes to scale something from the 1.2 million person organization. So uh, even when the, the funding is consistent and robust, it takes too long. So uh, you, it, it's the only way you can try to look at that is to be able to extend the life. So we're doing that. Just Thank you. You've talked about you know competitive space, contact areas of contact, uh, and uh, how it might pl how it has played out in uh, Ukraine and Crimea. But how do you how do you base new concepts, new continuum of operations, uh, with what is a legacy situation going back sixty years? Talking about Korea and uh, where you have a point of contact right there on the 38th parallel. How does, how does your new concepts work with that? A couple of things. I'd, first, I'd note that the pacing threat for the current MDO that we've just signed 6 December of last year is Russia. So the pacing threat is Russia. The, the theoretical construct is that a, a pacing threat is your preeminent threat, and then the lesser included um, would still be able to, you can reconcile the problems within them. In this particular case, we think because you're enhancing the role of all of your domains, and that is tools that are available to you beyond just the kinetic, that it's uniquely appropriate for lesser included threats, VSO, uh, Korea in this case, whatever, you know, as you know. Now, what 
what we've noticed, it would be no surprise that you know your cyber realms and space might not be as relevant in, in a North Korea scenario, less so than in, than some other places. But the um, the the need and the means by which we would fight is is in, is in addition to just the other domains. So we talked about being able to penetrate very quickly, being able to disintegrate their systems quickly to get to positions that force a recalculation. Those still apply. So as we as we validated this concept against Russia, and we have a number of times, we now have to take it out and make sure it works for the lesser included or, or identify where the variances would be. But I think that the, the, rele the, the relevance of the problem, that is that we have withdrawn, that we have threats who have built in multiple layers of standoff, and that if we're going to do anything about it, we have to penetrate and get to a position of advantage. should be no surprise in any of the scenarios we talked about. Do you have a follow-up on it? Okay, I'll take it. Okay, I'm just here in the aisle. Go ahead, um, a lot of what you're talking about with MDO requires the ability for our forces to communicate with each other, um, you know, sensor agnostic, shooter agnostic, and then even in, especially in non-kinetic spaces, which we don't really have right now. Um, even between Army systems, much less Army, Navy, Army, Air Force, space, and then much less our allies and partners. Um, I mean, do we have till 2028 to get that right? Yeah, so I'm glad you brought that up. I you remember what I said up front. A good concept is infeasible. <laughs> So what, what this does is it d definitely drives our, our requirements. We, we've got to sort this problem out. The other thing I mentioned is all the services agree that the biggest challenge is multi-domain command and control. We find is in the, in the war games that we do, we're used to as a, as a joint force um, bringing federated solutions to a problem that we ultimately sec synchronize at the highest level once we bring the, bring the federated solutions together. In a hyperactive, extremely lethal environment where sensors are ubiquitous, we won't likely have the, the luxury of synchronizing federated solutions. So what does that mean? A top-down framework, bottom-up fed, and, and we think what you're going to have to end up having is a common C2 structure or measure that will largely have to be augmented by artificial intelligence. And you can point out again, we don't have that. But as you, as you move forward, if you want to take advantage of opportunities and you don't want to miss the opportunity, we have to make decisions very quickly. It goes back to this robotics thing. I, I think artificial intelligence gives you more promise on the near-term horizon to augment human decision-making at the command and control level relative to having automated robotics. And that's where we think the most investment early on should happen. So let's just summarize real quick. We, the services agree MDC2 is going to be hard. Two is we think it's going to have to come top down, at least the structure to build it within. And that means the CCHO and, and the joint force, a big role coming up. And then third, human decision-making using artificial intelligence will be fundamental. Do you, do you see a conflict between that and the the need to use larger formations in peer-to-peer -peer conflict and the the, the need for, for mission command and, and command control at, at lower level where the systems are actually going to be used? I don't know that we need larger formations. In fact, if you look over history, armies get smaller and smaller and smaller and have to become more and more effective. What I said was that we need echelons above brigade to solve problems. So you will have echelon, a role for echelons, but look, our, our army continues to get smaller relative to if you look over the course of time and that's true for other armies too Russian army has gotten smaller probably the one that, where that is not so true is, is China which poses a problem right and so that means the effectiveness of these echelons and the agility of these smaller formations have to be exceedingly effective and lethal I think we have time for one more there's one more question out there no? Okay, then. Um, I'd like to thank uh, Dr. Kim McCarthy very much. Lieutenant General Wesley, thank you very much for joining us today. Thanks to all of you as well. Uh, have, a great, have a great week. Thank you for having me. Thanks. <laughs>